bit of a roundup of employment in your place. Um, myself and Janet B, as we have two Janets, Janet Barry have been heading it up this year. So um, we decided to divide it up last time that I would write for Destinations and Janet would do the, the webinar. And this time it's the other way around. I prefer writing, just saying. <laughs> anyway, I'm hoping that you've all enjoyed the shared endeavour and to take some lots of things away from it. What I'm going to do is a roundup of all of it, but also um, on some of the different quarters and some of the different um, questions that we came up with as part of the employment in your place shared endeavour. I've called it the fire frontier because it is. <laughs> so just to go back and reflect on a couple of the different quarters that we had, we focused in the first quarter of the year on village occupation. Um, I don't know about some of your studies. Uh, some of you are quite new to the society and some of you won't have a clue where my studies are. So uh, I'll apologise in advance if you've heard about mine a million times. Sorry, Jan, for you. <laughs> Um, I'll touch on a few bits of my studies um, and what I've done. Um, village occupations was fantastic for me because um, a lot of the endeavours that we've done in the past have been quite challenging for me uh, because I just haven't, I, I have two very small places and we don't talk about the third one, but I have two very small places that I do most of my work on, which are Techcot and Luffincot, which are on the border of Devon and Cornwall. Um, which is why Janet knows quite a bit about them because she's not very far away from them. Um, but village occupations was really useful to me. And I don't know if um, all of you, probably not all of you watched uh, Janet's uh, webinar, Janet Barry, where she talked about the censuses and going through the different occupations. And although I've been doing my place study for a long time, I had never thought about actually going through and taking the occupations on each of the pages of the censuses. And I literally went away in the webinar and all the census pages out and started tallying it. And it was really fascinating. I wrote an article that was my destinations article um, for the last um, edition. And it's just really interesting to see how things change over time. And that was the second and third um, part of the year, the industrialization in our places and employment changes in the 20th century were kind of how those uh, different things have impacted. Industrialisation uh, certainly impacts on most people is more than it will mine. It's very rural, my place, so it didn't have a huge amount of change over time. Um, and also employment changes in the 20th century touched on a little bit in the presentation. So um, the final frontier was about several things, um, extremes, black economy, unemployment and a bit of reflection as well. So um, Reason of having the shared endeavour, I thought because I know that we've got quite a lot of new members to the society, it would be quite useful to kind of explain why on earth we do these crazy things. Um, it was an idea many, many years ago that we would actually bring in the shared endeavour so that we would have, um, it, it would be an encouragement to focus on a particular uh, topic. So we've selected topics over the years that have ranged from migration, buildings and all sorts of things now to the occupations or employment in your place. Um, but personally, I've not done a great, a great deal because I've been society for some of those years on my place. So it encourages you to focus on a particular topic and actually set some goals. I'm a great goal setter for work and that, but I've never been fantastic at setting goals in my place or my one name or surname study. Um, I've always just kind of bumbled along and found my way through one way or the other, but not necessarily had a goal or a focus in my research. Um, sometimes people though have a very specific goal. We have members that have joined the society over the years, had a very specific goal in their research and actually sometimes a shared endeavor has helped them to kind of change. And, and off tangent and down a different track and also it offers a, 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 as a society it offers a platform for discussion because I don't know how you all feel about doing a community study but it can be pretty isolated that research I am unlucky I work in a small place not where I work for work, but my one place study is a very small place and I'm delighted when anyone cares about my place as much as I do, or even a tiny amount would be nice. <laughs> so it gives me a platform to actually focus on my study and share some of the ideas and thoughts that I've got about the research that I'm doing, because we've all got different 
Some are huge, some are tiny, some have loads of buildings in them, some have hardly any, some have changed over time, some are more rural, etc, etc, etc. So it just gives us that platform um, for discussion and for sharing. So that's why we've had the four um, Shared Endeavour webinars this year, which will change next year. But I'll let Steve talk about that at the end briefly, maybe if he's lucky. <laughs> So I thought I'd give you a brief overview of my places um, because I will talk a little bit about them and I think it helps to kind of see my places. Um, so on the left is um, Tetcot Manor, a very, very old manor house and that's taken from just outside the church gates. Uh, that's leave the oldest building um, in Tetcot and it has a granary and lots of outbuildings that are still very much, I won't say all original, but certainly the, a lot of the original um, buildings that were there. My places are very, very rural. If I turned around from there, I do have a photograph of um, the other way from, from the end of the church. And uh, a few will know this. It's just green everywhere. <laughs> if you can see a building, you're darned lucky. And you've got a pair of binoculars, probably. Um, so my places are really, really tiny. Um, there, there are very few attached so you can really find any um, terraced housing in my places the manor of course is its own house all by itself um, and all of the houses um, were built quite a long time ago there's very few sort of modern houses on the right hand side you can kind of see that that's not at the end of the churchyard but that's actually off on the track um, from Luffing the reason I do two places is not because of that it's helped by the fact I'm mad, but it's the fact that actually the boundaries change for my two places. Um, they're very, very close and the parishes intermingle and in one census, a house will be in one place. And in the next census, they've decided that it's changed to the town or hamlet called them Will, not a town, a <laughs> village next door. But you can imagine that the employment in my places basically is on the land. So you're not going to get much different from the kind of the, the farming and agriculture, or so I thought. So what's your place like? This is the bit where I'd like to hear a little bit more about yours. Um, and I've posed a couple of questions. Um, how many people um, who are on the webinar tonight have got rural or how many people have got urban studies? How does that affect the occupations that are listed in your census? Have you compared your place with another place that's close by? That's the thing I took away from Janet's webinar. I thought, okay, so mine are really rural. So Techcot and Luffincott, the nearest main town is a market town of Holsworthy. Um, I wouldn't call it big, Janet, would you? But, <laughs> but it's bigger than Techcot and Luffincott. And it was really interesting to compare the occupations in the two different places. And pre and post industrialization, how did the occupations in your place change over time? Who would like to start us off? <laughs> Don't be shy. Um, <laughs> I, I can I can start it off if no one else is going to. I mean, I have I have um, four places because basically I'm crazy. Um, and they are none of, none of them are anywhere resembling anything urban. Um, three are in Devon and one is in Northumberland, which is about as far away from Devon as you can get and still be in the same country. The one is a fishing village. So you get fishermen there mixing up with the agriculture. Um, the other two are predominantly rural and the one in Northumberland, again, it's, it's sheep farming country. So you've got lots of shepherds and not much else. However, you do also get some interesting open cast mining, which I wasn't expecting. So I think we have these preconceptions of what it, like you say, Kirsty, of you're expecting it all to be a whole load of wall-to-wall -wall agricultural labourers. And actually, mm. when you have a look. It perhaps isn't always like that. Now it's, no. now it's uh, someone else's turn. Um, I, I, well, I, mine, I, in, I'm the total the opposite of most people, I think, with my study. Mine's a street. It bangs smack in the centre of Taunton. Right. So, so I think it's it's the opposite of what I found with a lot of people's studies. It's the people who live in this area are either very affluent and uh, squires or gentlemen or lawyers or surgeons down to people who are 
their servants effectively <laughs> and a housemaid and that kind of thing so it's too there's kind of no middle ground in the occupations that I've when I've looked at mine because I listed all of my censuses recently following a bit of a low patch and yeah it was really interesting to see the the two really really different job groups when I kind of looked at them side by side so that was really interesting. Yeah, I was going to say there's the, the surprising thing for my place was that actually that I had quite a few annuitants, like you know people living off their off their own savings, which I hadn't really thought mm -hmm. to see my place as a particularly kind of what one would now call a wire to place back in the 1850s or 1860s. You know, people actually a lot of them um, were annuitants. Well, I say a lot of them. There's not a huge number of people in my place, but um, there were more than I was expecting. But the number of servants, like you were saying, that a lot of servants in my places as well. But what I did look at was the change over time, because farming, of course, the bottom fell out of farming between. So if you if you compare the 1851 and 1881, there's a huge difference in the number of servants in the big farmlands. Um, there's a huge number, a huge decrease in the number of servants that the farmers had. Yeah. I expect yes, it was quite interesting. One of the places I did, uh, I've, the small place I've got, um, which I haven't done anything with for ages, is a township. Um, and it was always it was described by run down and you know, how pathetic people were living and all the rest of it. But when I actually looked at the, um, it hadn't been done so much before in a critical matter because uh, it always used the buildings as, as what their study was it became very clear that the reason actually richer than uh, or better off than many other communities um, just up with, um, which is uh, what you know 40 miles further north is a bigger parish with lots of townships but up here we're much um, more paupers lots of cotters um, boarded out and all of that so very very much poorer despite being reasonably high quality uh, clan or you know led as they were then um, the other township was closer to the Duke of Argyle but he you know he threw out quite a lot of people he had you know a lot of um, um, he, he redesigned a lot of his places because people were so poor um, and but that um, had annuitants um, and had their, their craft. And I think because there were so many um, quarries in the area, uh, the second sons stayed because, and they carried on working. Uh, so they were contributing back in. So a lot of the girls there weren't servants and they, a lot of, and not quite a number of the households took in families from, uh, took in kids from other families. So it was quite interesting that, you know, it had always been presumed as being sort of the, 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 the bottom end of, the, of society and actually, it, within that sphere, they did pretty well. So whereabouts is your place? Um, we're Argyle. Okay, yeah. I'm Ardhatton. Yeah, Ardhatton oh, yeah. and then further south. Yeah. Yes, finally getting round to actually joining in. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually we all get there. One day. <laughs> <laughs> No, the interesting thing when, when I was just listening to you there is what I also looked at was when people, because I, I didn't do a huge amount of the migration um, shared endeavour because there isn't a huge amount of migration when you don't have a huge population. So there's not that much, or I didn't think there was much of great excitement. The thing that I found quite interesting um, was I actually started plotting out some of the families and what happened to the youngsters. So as they grew up, did they, were they, uh, servants within the parish or did they go to a different parish and it's really interesting that actually a lot of the uh, uh, well, from one particular family actually on one that was their name study so uh, a lot of them actually only went to the parish so not laughing or annoyingly but the next one which is Clawton or maybe Ashwater which is also not very far away just over the um, main road not very but road compared to the ones to get to the tech court and laughing court 
but yeah they don't move too far um because the work they do they can do still locally which is, which is good yeah ours move a lot um i started mm -hmm. with the, the farmhouse i'm living in you know i'm uh, you see the farmhouse here um <laughs> and it was quite astonishing to see that in the uh, in the censuses there were it was very rare that there was the same family in the next 10 years um, until you get into the 1900s um, there was a huge amount of movement in and out of here um, and again you sort of presume west west coast of scotland we're at the back end of nowhere people came in and stayed mm -mm, there are actually very few families here relatively for it's a what's about 1700 um population um there are a couple of dozen families who are who can go back five six generations um so yeah we i was surprised mm -hmm. so who, who who's watching has got any kind of real changes with their industrialization because like when i was talking before i don't see too much with that apart from the fact that the number of servants seem to decrease in terms of the the farming and things has anyone seen massive changes in the operation of industrialization you can really see that i suppose janet b you're probably one of those with with the, <laughs> the i know what your area is like but <laughs> <laughs> i am one of them yes and uh i think jo joanne who's also online tonight has um one of her studies is Burnley, which is just north of my place, and that will have seen massive changes as well. But uh, yes, up until 16th century, it was under forest law. So there was nothing going on. There was a few cow farmers and that remained short, um, small scale farming really until the industrial revolution. And it's interesting to change through the censuses how the number of mill workers has changed and an increasing number of people who were in the mill. And as a consequence of that and the increased opportunities for local girls, a lot of the domestic servants were then born outside and came into the area. And you can trace the migration of those people as well. Mm. But um, what is, it's very poor quality land, so it's mainly pastoral farming. And what is interesting looking through the, the censuses over the, the decades is the persistence of really quite small scale farms 10 12 eight acres and you think how on earth did they make a living farming 10 acres of bog basically mm. um, one thing that did surprise me is because it is mainly small scale pastoral farming it was mainly families with the occasional um live-in farm servants and I thought we didn't have any ag labs and that whereas people like Kirsty probably have hundreds of them or at least a fair proportion. Ours were all cotton weavers, but actually there were more like ag labs than I thought they were going to be. Amazing when you actually do the statistics. Yeah, what your assumptions are and what the reality was can be uh, very different and it's always worth going back and checking. Definitely. I mean, I must have had those census records saved for donkey jonks. You know, the moment they, everything came online on Ancestry and Find My Past, you know, I was, that was things I did. Laughing Call 1841, Tech Call 1841. <laughs> but I do anything with them? No. <laughs> just, yeah. them, just in case they disappear from Ancestry, never to be seen again. <laughs> and yet, actually, there's so much you can do with them, isn't there? There's, there's age, yeah, and sex, really. age and sex uh, profiles, there's migration in and out, there's exactly. employment as we're doing now. Yeah. Um, Janet just made a really good point actually it's just popped off off of my chat but um, Janet you mentioned about the second homeowners so I think that's Bucks Mills that that tends mm. to be for you isn't it Janet but that's equally the same for me where people have moved down from like London and moved into Tetcot and done up the old building and things that were fairly derelict slash run down um, so I think that's it's not so much but certainly people who've moved in from out of the area certainly post World War II So we've, we've kind of done <laughs> So I'll move on a little bit. Um, so the extremes concept um, for this particular part of the shared endeavour, um, I thought it'd be kind of nice to hear some of the unusual things you found. Um, I don't have particularly exciting unusual occupations, but I'm really excited to hear about yours. <laughs> um, but I'm also excited to hear about um, what era that might have appeared in. 
So what's your most unusual occupation? Or do you have one? <laughs> um, what era did that appear in? And also what the source of that information was, because we do focus a lot as one place as well. I speak for myself here. I do focus a lot on the baptisms, marriages, burials, parish chest kind of stuff, census records, things like that, wills. Um, but maybe there, there might be some interesting sources for us all to kind of think about too. Um, who employed the most servants and did that change over time? And who was the oldest person employed in your place and perhaps the youngest? So anyone got anything they'd like to share on any of those questions? I want to hear about your exciting occupation. <laughs> I have clay, clay miners uh, in abundance. I mean, the, the Eden Project is right oh, yeah. next door. Uh, so um, I don't know if that's considered sufficiently exotic, but... I think it depends on what we have in our own places. Because I'd love to have a clay miner in Tepcot, but they probably wouldn't live there. <laughs> I like that, a stagger, a stagger maker, bottom knocker. Are they two different things, Richard, or are they one? I, I, um, yeah. A saga was a vessel that you put pottery in before you fired it. Okay. Um, it was made by making a frame and then a bottom and moulding them together. So uh, it's literally, that's the title of the job? That's the job, yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> I think you, you could box and cox it into something quite funny, I'm sure. Um, yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Where's your place, Richard? I've forgotten. Armitage in Staffordshire. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Armitage where? Armitage Shanks. Yeah. I've been living in the middle of nowhere, Nicola says. I don't have any policemen. All of my people seem to leave the, the West Country to go in London if they're going to be policemen. <laughs> A retired ship broker living in the Pennine village, says Catherine. He doesn't appear to have any connection to the village other than living there. Well, that's a good connection in itself. What about anybody else? Anybody? I think I think Richard, you are winning for me at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, anybody else? I, I challenge you to beat Saga Maker, bottom bottom knocker. That is just incredible. <laughs> I think I, I think. You, oh no, someone's got one. Go on. I have somebody who described themselves as a chair bottomer. I was, I've typed it wrong. I'm sorry. And I've no <laughs> idea what a chair bottomer was when there's no <laughs> evidence of a chair bottom. topper. <laughs> I, Janet, I, thought, I thought you were mentioning something about your problems at the moment when you said chair. No, 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 no. I do have a chair bottomer. Um, maybe a chair topper was a joiner, I don't know. But uh, why that's different to a bolster, I have absolutely no idea. A medical electrician, Liz has just said as well. A medical electrician. Yeah, that, that's when they, they give you shocks because it's supposed to settle your brain and stuff. It's like a, an early form of, um, of oh, ECT. I've never heard it called that. And, and people used to go around fairs and think this is a really good idea. And, you know, forget the, the freak yeah. show and the candy floss. Let's all, let's all be electrocuted for fun, you know. Wow. Mm. It's not a current <laughs> occupation, though. No, oh, stop oh, it. Oh, oh, oh. oh, dear, oh, dear. I'm sure they meet a lot of resistance, Steve. <laughs> Medical electrician apply electricity to parts of the body to shore things a quack, said, said Lee. Wow. I mean, there's, there's I've, I've got um, the Colin, is it Waters or Walters? Colin, I think it's Colin Waters, A to Z of Victorian operations. There's some corkers in there. Um, what, what was my favourite one? It was like Richard's. Oh, a knock nobbler. Knock nobbler is my favourite one, and that's. Um, I think that's the one that gets um, uh, shoes dogs out of churches. A knock nobbler. That was an interesting one, but I, but I do think that Richard's possibly won the prize there. <laughs> my my most curious one is not actually a an, a, a op. Um, it's a, it's one of my own, and that is why would somebody in the 1700s, in a tiny village in Yorkshire, when his siblings are cobblers, butchers, what have you, be a transcriber? 
sorry, translator. <laughs> What's he translating? And it's twice, it's two children, it's my great-grandfather. Um, it's, it's just a little village in, in North Yorkshire. Um, 17, oh, 17, 8 and 12. Um, two children and he's a translator the only thing i was thinking is you know it, you know, it's just after the um the union is he translating from scots maybe uh, what what year did you did you say what year that was jill i didn't hear it uh 1708 and 12 if i remember rightly wow yeah i mean it's That's early yeah um quite couldn't doesn't doesn't seem to make any sense it's hemsworth in in yorkshire and it doesn't really you know it's there's no I can't work out that there's you know, a priory or, or anything like that, but you know, he might have been involved with, and it's, it's two baptisms. <laughs> so, yeah. Jenny just said she has a mugger. I'm glad she carried on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he called himself a China dealer. <laughs> I was like, okay, is this something somebody would record on a census, a mugger? <laughs> but maybe it's somebody who made mugs. I'm intrigued, I'm intrigued to know what kind of time frame that was. Um, Jenny, I will... Hello? We lost you, Kirsty. Are, are you still there? He gone. Yeah. She's frozen. She's gone. Frozen. <laughs> Nobody I, starts I say... singing. <laughs> <laughs> Behave, Steve. <laughs> Well, I, um, I, I had a gas secretary on my study in the Crescent, and that obviously got mm -hmm. me, do not start, Steve, that got me into all kinds of things. I've, and, and then I finally figured out it was to do with a gas works that was on the outskirts of Taunton, um, closer to Norton Fitzwarren. But initially, I was like, a gas secretary? <laughs> I couldn't possibly comment. I'm sure. Okay, I could possibly comment, but I won't. Oh, I bet you won't. On, um, on Twitter, um, Dr. Sophie K has been doing an occupation of the day hashtag for a little while, um, taking occupations out of a 1927 dictionary of occupational terms. So there's, there's quite a wealth of um, unusual occupations on there, like um, an eager hooker or bottom man. Um, don't know why that one attracted my attention. They, uh, the definition is stands at bottom of shaft in coal or shale mine to push the full tubs onto the cage and remove the empty ones and signals to winding engine man to start or stop winding. So a bottom man wasn't what I thought it was going to be. <laughs> I, I've got something interesting about the translator. Google is my friend. Um, it's apparently not necessarily what we would automatically think. It's in the shoe trade, a person who translates or remakes old shoes into a new shoe, i.e. a cobbler, it says here. Oh. So that's another possibility. So that, that sounds as if it fits more with the, the kind of social ambience that you've got there and the rest of the family. Um, so maybe it's not somebody who, you know, turns French into mm -hmm. English or something yeah I, I had looked up and I hadn't it, I'd never found that one thank you see, no, it's I, always worth asking something yes I'm, I'm trying to see what um what web, uh, it wasn't it, it took a little bit of googling to come up it's the the whole genealogy website old occupation names now obviously I've no idea how um how accurate these are but one assumes that Mr. or Mrs. Hall must have got it from somewhere, if that's what their names are. <laughs> but I offer it to you as a possibility anyway, and <laughs> probably more, more research needed. One yeah. well, thank you for continuing while my internet decided to just completely disappear. <laughs> <laughs> we hardly know you're gone. That's not true. But <laughs> <laughs> I just snuck back in again, put the slide back up as if nothing had ever happened. Exactly. <laughs> And actually, this is much more solid, so this might be a learning point. So apologies for that anyway. Um, did we get any comments on the oldest person employed in a place? Has anyone done anything on, on that, the youngest and the oldest? I had an 86-year-old minister. 
Oh, wow. And he was he was uh, enumerated as minister rather than retired minister, but whether he was still active or not, I don't know. Goodness gracious, that's quite old, isn't it? And there were quite Has a anybody few else seven... looked at that? I, 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 yeah, I've, I've got quite a lot of seventies, but I don't I don't think I I don't think I hit eighty on any of mine. <laughs> In fact, I think they're all dead by the time they're eighty. But anyway, <laughs> that's another study. <laughs> So they're definitely not working. <laughs> I've got a, I've got a hundred year old uh, lady uh, who was still registered as sort of doing things in as, as a crop wow. uh, late earlier on about uh, yes about eight years earlier, um, and then there are yeah there are a number of one of the quarries still mm. at uh, eighty six. <laughs> so, yes. Wow. Yeah. Just goes to show the but I think once, the, once they got past 14 on childbirth, they just carried on. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> no, it's definitely one of the questions that I haven't looked into quite so much, but I was just, again, intrigued. Um, I, I didn't put the black economy bit in, Janet did, and I was just fascinated because I thought, what, what earth is black economy when she dropped it up? I was like, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for putting it in because it makes Kirsty do some research. Yay! <laughs> so I found some blooming fascinating stuff because um, I've got um British newspaper archives um, subscription, which I have to say I don't use very much. Uh, you know, it merrily goes out every month at £12, whatever it is. Um, and I don't really use it an enormous amount. So I thought, I'm just going to have a little look at that. So there we are. I've got my petty sessions of 1868 when John Pooley of Luffincourt was summoned for setting a snare to catch game. Now, the fascinating thing for me is he was fined six shillings, sorry, uh, six pence and costs. But the vicar, the Reverend Frank Parker, paid the fine. <laughs> I was like, I was completely baffled by that. Why, why on earth would the local vicar pay that? I've got absolutely no idea. But the also fascinating thing is that VP Calmedy Esquire, I actually have the most expensive thing I've ever bought for my one place study. I have um, a statue that was presented to him. I don't actually have the statue. I've got a picture of it and it's in my living room. <laughs> So, so not only was it quite interesting to find something on Luffincott, which is tiny, um, it was also quite exciting to have VP Calmedy in there and Frank Parker, who's actually buried in Luffincott Church. So for the sake of four lines, I was quite excited to find that. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't find any moonlighting, although I have to say that I did discover when I was searching for Tetcot and I did try putting in Tetcot and prostitutes. Which I thought was a fantastic search function, <laughs> not to be done at work. <laughs> <laughs> Don't search for that. Um, but I did search and, and I didn't realise that there's a street called Tech or either road or street up in London. And I never knew that. So that was another little how on earth does that happen? Because there's HMS Tech Cot, but I didn't know there was a road in London called Tech Cot. So that was, although not connected with the uh, with, with my place, which was good because I didn't really want to find any prostitutes in tech, tech I mean, Janet, it's not a good place to stand on a street corner, is it, at the best of times? Not a lot of passing <laughs> trade. I'll tell you what you mustn't do. Um, when I was searching old occupations and I, yeah. put, I put in Victorian prostitutes and therefore got every prostitute in Victoria, Australia, Victoria, oh, Canada. Oh, my God. And aren't they all okay? <laughs> Clearly, I should have put in 19th century prostitutes, but it never occurred to me at the time. So. No, it's funny. You just put things in and afterwards you go, why the heck did I do that? Yes. <laughs> yes. We've had quite a lot of poaching coming through on the chat discussion, including Liz Craig, who's found her own family poaching. And Catherine Ryan, similarly, my great great grandfather was a notorious poacher. <laughs> so, oh, wow. really Holly as well. Interestingly, Isn't when it? my place was subject to forest law, which was back in the 15th, 16th centuries, mm. being caught in the forest with a dog was evidence of poaching until proven otherwise, because you had no reason to be there with a dog. 
Ah. So uh, you had some explaining. <laughs> you had some explaining to do if you were caught under those circumstances. Yeah. Well, I have the Tech Court Hunt, which is still in Tech Court even now, which is a fox, fox and fox and hounds hunting, um, which we can probably discuss at length. People's perspectives and opinions on that, but that's been in Tech Court for years and years and years. I mean, there's Tech Court. I don't know if I've got them anywhere. No, they're not nearby. But I've got lots of Tech Court Hunt badges. They do sort of annual badges and things that you can you can buy and. Bearing in mind my place is so tiny and you get very little memorabilia. I've got quite a few of those. <laughs> so who else? I've seen lots of comments there. Jane, Jane Barton, lots of poaching in my place. <laughs> what, what about any fraud or any kind of moonlighting and things? Anyone got any sort of money laundering and things that they found in their place? Or is it not something people have searched for? Mm. Not so much. Interesting one, one in recent times, the house, one of the houses in my place ha was identified on Google Maps as being the um, registered address of a private detective agency. And I, oh, spoke, wow. to the, I spoke to the owners who denied all knowledge of that. So uh, ah. either they were doing that and keeping mum or... Undercover. Yeah, well, you never know. No. I have a question about the, the last item on your news article here which is first tipped over the tin what what was that referring to i have no idea i'm glad you spotted that because i linked to it as well i was like what on earth is that i mean i'm assuming he was brought up by pc um seabright for arrears in bastardy and i presume but it's a guess that there were a, that i i know i was going to say something about a tin of money but it doesn't make any sense does it don't know. No idea. It was just the end. It was literally the end of that article as well. There was nothing else. So I've literally cut it exactly where the end was. So no idea. Is it? Is it a Devonism, Janet? <laughs> no, I didn't think so. <laughs> no idea. Tipped over the tin. I mean, it, it does imply that there's like a tin of money and it's, but it doesn't kind of make any sense. Don't know. No idea. Sorry, I don't have the answer to that one. Doesn't look like anyone else. Lots of shaking of heads there. <laughs> can see Helen going, no, I haven't got a clue either. <laughs> no idea. Uh, well, we've got some comments there. Great records here from the 1600s with landowners complaining about the village inhabitants stealing and cutting down from their woods, says Jenny. <laughs> That's fabulous. I like those. Good. Yeah, I mean, I think there's so many records out there. That's what I've, as I said before, I've, I focused on, I suppose I was a collector, really, first of all. I collected everything. And because a lot of my uh, microfiche um, records, of, I could purchase the microfiche from Devon all those years ago. I've had the fiche and I've had a microfiche reader. So I just accepted that I had copies of all the birth, marriages and deaths, or not birth, marriage and deaths, baptisms, marriages and burials, some of the bands, apart from the tech cop marriages, which have been destroyed by some silly person who couldn't actually store them properly. But anyway, that's another co co conversation for another day. <laughs> but I just didn't really look at newspapers mm -hmm. and I didn't sort of look outside the box, literally the parish chest being the box. I just kind of went, OK, I've got all of that. And I spent ages going through all the wills up at the National Archives, which now they're giving away for free. Thank you. I photocopied them at 50p a copy of every sheet, not bitter at all, <laughs> but I've got them all, it's fine. <laughs> but now I've actually gone back and I think that's, as I said before, the, the great thing about the shared endeavor, it does make you focus on looking at different things and focusing on different, different topics and stuff. This is another one that I thought I'd share with you, um, which I, I don't get many records that pop up in the, in the um, newspapers. Um, so George Cobbledick, labourer of Luffin Cot, was fined 25, uh, 25 shillings for stealing fruit from the Glebe farm. Shocking. <laughs> and that was, again, from, that was 1930, though. That wasn't an old one. Um, so definitely, if you've got access to any sort of, it doesn't have to be British newspaper archives, there's newspapers.com. There's the uh, Find My Past. I've got some newspapers um, through there. I think, it, I think you have to have a, 
kind of not a monthly subscription, an annual subscription to access the newspapers, I think. Um, but there's also stuff that has been transcribed online and things like that as well. So there's lots of stuff out there for different places. So get back onto there. The now this, uh, Scotsman. Oh, oh, Scotsman for mm -hmm. Scottish ones. Yeah, absolutely. And the London Gazette as well has got a lot. If it's a national, uh, national one, London Gazette or but Edinburgh that, Gazette. That's, that's free. If you if you sign on to the Scottish uh, lives. Uh, you can access the um, Scotsman for free. Oh, okay. Do, I don't know how many people have got Scot How many Scottish uh, studies have we got? I'm not even I sure. Realized. Me. Mm -hmm. How many Scottish studies have we got? Me. I've got one. Yeah. Ah, there's a me. I can hear a me. I can. I recognise yeah, that. I recognise that accent. <laughs> <laughs> couple in the room and I... but but the accent doesn't necessarily mean that you have a study that's in in scotland because <laughs> i don't live in devon <laughs> has, has has the me has the me worked out i've got one in yorkshire and one in scotland ah okay yes i think that's a jane uh, me uh, isn't oh. it no hi jane oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> no that's claire Claire Wilson. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> there is me because I, I was thinking Jane is Jane Harris not with us tonight. Uh, oh, I don't know. <laughs> no, Jane. Ah, Harris, Jane that Harris was the Jane that I was thinking of. You see, Jane yeah. Harris. That was the Jane me. that I had in my head. <laughs> the um, the map on our website is suggesting we have ten registered studies That's in good. Scotland. Beat me to it, Steve. I was hoping that while I was wittering, somebody would be looking. Thank you. <laughs> uh, have, all, have, all the, have all the Scots uh, picked up that our Kirk sessions are actually coming next year? Yeah. Next year? <laughs> there we are. Those those of us who've got to parish like me what just want a complete alternative universe to go and hide myself in. <laughs> <laughs> keep keep that for your news flash, Steve, somewhere on social media. <laughs> yes, that'll be in um, next week's news from the Twitter sphere for sure. Yeah. Lovely. I like that news from the Twitter sphere. It's brilliant. I like it. <laughs> if, if you look on, yes, if you look a lot of good stuff. So one of the other parts of um, quarter four was about unemployment. Um, and this used to be called the Office for National Statistics. I'll try that word again in English. Office for National Statistics, Neighbourhood Statistics, but it's now NOMIS or something crackers. It took me ages to find it when I was looking for it um, to put the stats on here. Now, this is great if you're a nosy parker. Now, we all know that we're all nosy parkers. So this is, um, I don't know how far reaching this is, but certainly for those of us who have, I'll say English studies, um, I don't know whether it's Wales um, and Scotland as well. Um, you'd have to look at that. Um, for individual studies, but this is for, this is the unemployment for me, or or I should say employment rather than unemployment. Um, but the employment in my place, according to the 2011 census statistics, which was fascinating. Um, so all usual residents aged 16 to, to 74, there are 121, and you can see that the only un unemployment I actually have in my place in 2011 is two people who are long term unemployed. Just pretty good. So, of course, you can even drill down further than that. I mean, not just on what I've shown you on the screen there, but you can also see whether they're male or female. Yay! <laughs> so if your place is bigger, it's even better. So male is on the left hand side and female is on the right. So actually, there's one of each. But please explain to me how it's 1.7 for one person as male and 1.6 for female. Let's not get down that track. <laughs> just boggled my mathematical brain <laughs> but anyways so it's it's really interesting though in terms of the self-employment I think because being a self-employed person myself I think in a small place like mine which as you saw in the last slides only got 100 and what was it let's just flick back a second oh 
there we go 121 people to have 29 or 30, 29 people which is 24 percent are self-employed my goodness gracious you wouldn't have that back in 1851 or 1881 yes they might be working on the farm but most of the people that I that I can go back at particularly to the tithe maps they didn't own the farm they lived on it and they worked it they didn't own it so they were employed by the people that own the farm generally so self-employment I think to be 24 percent is quite high um, in my tiny little place yeah it's a quarter of the people in the place um, full-time students not greatly surprising because it being as rural as it is you're not going to have that many young people that live there now but the interesting thing for me is that my place has actually been impacted by social housing only one of my two places Luffincott not but Tetcott does have a set of social housing I say set of it's a little close of social housing that's been built in more recent years um, council housing basically um, but interestingly that doesn't have such an impact I don't think I mean slightly stereotypical but some of those some of the time therefore they're unemployed or they're you know work, working mothers or whatever um that are in council houses um certainly in my area where i live um but not so much in my in my place so that was quite interesting as i say the breakdown of male male versus female was also quite interesting so self-employed looking at that particular statistic bearing in mind i am myself um, male, 39% of the population in there were self-employed, but only 97 for female, which is interesting. So I just find statistics quite fascinating, but <laughs> has anybody else looked at unemployment in their places, e either historically or more recent times? Yeah. Not so much. Not at much. all. Lots of people shaking heads. I can see on the cameras, they were like, no. <laughs> that looked like a good glass of wine though, Jane, I will say. <laughs> You know, like we have a, a no, general. We do yeah. have a lot of 1820s uh, and mm -hmm. to the 1840s for St. Blasey. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of what's the right word? Uh, transitory residents. Uh, you can tell this from uh, since this is pre census, you can tell this from the uh, birthplaces of the parents and then where the children wound up moving to. Um, there, there's quite a, and, it, and it's very decidedly in, it, in the 1820s that it very specifically spikes up. Uh, so I think there was searching for employment that was going on and uh, a lot of uh, people actually emigrated at that point as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting comment that a couple of people have put on the side panel there about um, journeymen and, and the tenant farmers. Um, Steve, I like your comment about the journeymen in whatever craft worked for whoever would employ them. I wonder, though, if that's a little bit like what we call now subcontracting. So whether they would be self-employed, but take whatever work they could get. I don't know quite how they'd be allocated in the stats. I'm not sure. Yeah, not sure. And I think journeyman is a phrase that I think goes back to times before self-employed probably doesn't have the meaning mm. that it does today, which is largely one for no. tax purposes. Yes, true. <laughs> yeah, they probably didn't care in 1851 when they were journeyman mason and glazers or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think a good point that Catherine's made as well. Tenant farmers don't consider themselves to be employed and may be employers themselves. That's true. That is very true. Sorry, someone else is going to make a point. Was that Janet B? Yeah. Yeah, it's, I've not studied unemployment as yeah. such, but one thing I've noticed from the census um, look, um, studies is the, the number of women who do not have a documented employment against their names. And I'm sure that mm -hmm. female employment is underrepresented in our local censuses in the oh, mid-19th mid yeah. century. You know, I don't believe that all this, like some of them were there, you know, farmer's wife or quarryman's wife or quarryman's yes. daughter or something. I bet not they were really all sure that's an occupation. <laughs> no, I bet they were all cotton weavers. <laughs> and, I, you know, can whether I, there was something can I just, about Lisa, yeah. Can I yeah, add to that? There's, there's a really interesting um, study going on in um, 
well, it's in three counties, but Cumbria is one of them, which is why I know about it. It's, I think, an AHRC funded three year research project looking at vouchers, receipts uh, in the workhouse, um, oh, right. looking at who was supplying them. So they've got things like receipts for fabric, for clothing, for shoes, for foodstuffs, for seeds and gardening tools, all kinds of things. And wow. one of the patterns that's coming out of that quite strongly is that there are an awful lot of women who are running small businesses supplying the workhouse with bread or with, you know, and when you look at other documentation, they don't appear, they don't appear in the trade directories, they don't appear in, um, you know, you can't identify them through other means, but they are picking them up yeah. through these receipts into the workhouse because their business was so small that it didn't mm. register. Well, what period of time directory. is that, Jane? What period of time is the, is, what period of time is the study? Um, Oh, late 1700s through to mid to late 1800s, that kind of time period. So, so possibly might be picked up in the poor law if they're being paid by the local parish, maybe. But otherwise, as you say, they might not get picked up at all. Yeah, yeah. Mm. These are um, the, the study picked up three locations where they had a big collection of these vouchers uh, were associated with the parish and the poor law and the workhouse, um, just where they happened to have survived. Um, wow. so there's one down in the south coast of England somewhere, maybe one possibly Shropshire kind of area. I know there are Keele University participants, um, not sure exactly, but it, they're quite widely dispersed and mm. they're picking up a similar pattern in all, all three locations. Ooh. So and who's that running through? Who did you mention? AHRC? Yeah, it, it's, um, I'm trying to think what the, what it's called. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll share it on um, One Place Wednesday yeah. tomorrow. I'll share the link. Um, but they usually have a study day in November. <laughs> and obviously it's not happened this year. Um, but they've done one the past two Novembers and it's been really, really interesting. Um, so I think there's probably quite a lot of publishing to come off the end of that project when they're done. Um, some, some really interesting findings. Cool. And it's on the door that. That's really place. good. It's really close <laughs> to my place. So it's a similar kind of economy, which is which is really interesting. And whereabouts is your place, Jane? Um, I'm in North Cumbria, um, sort of southwest of Carlisle, but just before you get into the Lake District. So it's where I think I've just passed you on my I think I might have just passed you on my um Land's End to John O'Groats challenge. <laughs> could well have done could well have done it's it's uh it's not on the road to anywhere it's really tucked away oh, okay. in the corner it's a very very quiet place um i've just just got into york was it yorkshire national park yesterday i can't remember i passed bradford as janet janet barry commented <laughs> that the, the, the postcard that i was given from my virtual challenge was that bradford was lovely and janet informed me that it really is not <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure there are lovely corners but you'd have to look quite hard for them I yeah that's about absolutely right, yeah. I, I ran through it very quickly, it's fine. <laughs> Got into the Yorkshire National Park or Yorkshire Dales, whatever it's called. <laughs> Okie dokie, so let's have a little think. Oh, hang on, I've just clicked too many times. There we go. So um, we are at the end of the, not webinar, don't panic. We are at the end of the year. <laughs> so um, I thought it was, it's always good to pose a few questions, I find. Um, I don't know how many of you started the shared endeavour and actually set any goals at the beginning, um, but it's always good to reflect back and look at whether you actually achieved your goals if you <laughs> did actually set any in the first place. And if you didn't set any, that's fine. Not And my why was that? It's not like a, why didn't you set the goals? <laughs> but sometimes it's better not to. So that's fine too. So um, it'd be interesting to hear if people did set goals and, and how they've got along along the way um did you find anything fascinating on it or unexpected along the way and uh, it's a bit of a plug at the end um have you told any of your stories um either on your own website in destinations or one place wednesday comments or whatever um so i don't know if anybody wanted to to share any answers to their reflections on the shared endeavor Oh, quiet. Either that or I've frozen. <laughs> no one wants to confess whether they set goals or not. Confess, but that's <laughs> pretty, in destination. Pretty much in any goals I try to set, I... Sorry. 
No, go on. It's pre pretty much fair to get to uh, re reviving the, the one place stuff at all. But I was meant to be trying to get a war memorial, which would have been presumably the biggest uh, operation because we're one of the very few places that doesn't have, have a war memorial. Um, oh, there was right. a pla couple of plaques in one of the churches that sold. Uh, they've sort of, they, they sort of made out that that was all they needed. Um, but of course, having moved, that one is now locked all the time, whereas the other one wasn't. Um, and they also found the other closed churches. And I mentioned that I had a print of a copy of a, another one that mission was there was nowhere for people who might want to visit to uh, remember. Um, and actually, none of those on any of them are accurate, unsurprisingly. Um, so, you know, it's quite a big place. And so that was alongside that, um, do some homework on exactly who. And I have got quite a number of that, uh, some of that done, but it's, it's not complete. Um, but we got. Is it just me struggling with Jill's sound? Struggling Sorry. Bit, yeah. yeah, Jill, we're struggling with your sound. Can you perhaps switch your video off? Because the bandwidth is just really annihilating when, when you're speaking. Right. Don't worry about it. No, it's all right. We've managed to pick up most of that, I think. But it, it was very dippy at times. I wondered if it was me because I know I'd had problems. <laughs> No, okay. <laughs> yes, I've, I, shit, no. No. I think she's having, having more problems than I am, which is quite remarkable. <laughs> Any other exciting finds? Any fascinating finds when it came to employment um, that you weren't expecting? Or did nobody find anything absolutely phantasmagorical? but enjoyed it anyway. <laughs> um, I found that one of the houses on the Crescent was yeah. um, a Wesleyan minister's home, but it was right next door to the Masonic Lodge, which is on the Crescent, which was a bit odd. So I'm still researching the Freemasons. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that was that, yeah. That was quite interesting. And the, the Wesleyan ministers, a couple of them were also Freemasons. Okay. So I'm still trying to get weird, around like, that one. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like Liz's comment. <laughs> She's just put on the chat. I couldn't participate as fully as I'd have liked because I didn't have my census info in the format which I could easily extract data. But I'm there now, just as the shared endeavor is over. <laughs> Yeah, but as, Good, Liz, um, we focused you. <laughs> as Janet Few um, pointed out in a, in the chat earlier, that all of the um, shared endeavours that we've done, the uh, the material, the questions, um, they're all yeah, on the website. All on the in website. The area. So anybody that wants to pick any of those up um, can still do so and and use it to kind of give them some direction on those particular topics. Yeah. It's not a one hit wonder. It's not you have to be here to do it at the time. It's always there. <laughs> hmm. Okie dokie. Well, as you're there, Steve, don't unmute yourself. Um, but I wanted to leave everyone with a what, <laughs> or not unmute yourself, don't mute yourself again. You know what I mean. Um, so I wanted to leave you with a what next and kind of think about how you can move on from what you have done and maybe set some new goals and things like that. Um, Liz has just given me a blooming marvellous segue and I didn't pay her. What is next year's so I can get ready? Well, Liz, it's a different plan for next year. So I'm going to hand over to the unmuted Steve. <laughs> yeah. And Liz, you actually know what next year is. <gasps> she does. She's, get, she's given um, us a beautiful segue. <laughs> yeah. Um, I came up a little while back with the idea of um, blogging. Uh, prompts 
um, that we could do. And when we looked at it a while back at one of the committee meetings, um, we thought that rather than launch it while we got the um, shared endeavour going on uh, and kind of conflict with that, um, we would run the prompts from 2021 as an alternative to the shared endeavour. Um, so we've had, what, seven years of shared endeavours? Uh, and I'm not saying they won't happen again, because the blogging prompts might fall flat on their face. Who knows? Um, anyway. hopefully, hopefully a lot of people will be able to join in, if not with all of the individual monthly prompts, with some of them. Um, and that was part of the idea that quite often the, um, the shared endeavours, I think some people uh, probably find that it's... Um, possibly too big an undertaking or it's something a topic that perhaps they can't really tackle because of the place mm. that they're dealing with so and rather than do a weekly prompt as some of the things like the 52 ancestors do um i figured monthly might be an interesting one so it there would be 12 topics over the or prompts over the course of the year and you can kind of pick and choose which ones uh, are of interest to you, which ones are feasible given the nature of your one place study um, and join in with those that you want to and that hopefully between us over the course of the year we'll, um, we'll cover them all um, <laughs> and we shall see what happens. Um, there's certainly been expressions of interest <laughs> shall we say online uh, on Twitter and whatnot so uh, um January will be approached uh, with great interest to see just how many um, <laughs> blogs we get uh, on the theme of landmarks. Um, and then women in February and so on. We shall see what happens. But um, we've only announced the, the first six uh, months of prompts and they've been expanded beyond uh, blogging to include social media so people can join in by tweeting or posting to Facebook or to Instagram with hashtags so that you can put in just small individual uh, contributions tweets and posts and photos on the particular subject. Yeah. Um, and hopefully then I can kind of do a summary of what we've seen at the, at the end of each month. Yes, indeed, Richard, tweet um, or post to Facebook. Or <laughs> Nic whatever. Nicola said, um, how do we join in because she's got no website? Then the answer right. is if you want to do a blog and send it to Steve, then we can put it on the website we can, we as can a society. Put it on our website. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That, that's the other idea. If you haven't got a website, if you don't really do social media, uh, by all means, uh, send them through and to myself if you want to do a blog, yeah. and we can include it on ours. Um, and a suggestion I put forward recently to the committee was that, particularly uh, to help those who don't have websites, the profile pages that you have uh, mm, on the, the website that um, we could actually add not just you know the overview of your study your name and a contact email address and your website address we could actually index any of your blog posts that are on our website there so that your profile page then acts as a, a gateway to your contributions to the society that people can find mm. so almost like having a, a little mini website on ours um, so Helen just said it sounds like so Helen just said sorry to interrupt Steve it says um yeah. Helen just said it sounds like several of us would benefit from a webinar on how to use social media and mm. um Richard's also asked further up on the chat who's going to show me how to do a blog then so I wonder <laughs> if maybe maybe you know I have this spaces is I have spaces <laughs> well <year>. yes <laughs> I know you have spaces Janet but I was wondering if it might need to be earlier in the year and I know you haven't got spaces early in the year so I was wondering if maybe um someone who does blogging and someone who does social media um might combine forces Steve um and maybe <laughs> we could do some, we could do something together <laughs> as like a one-off not the not not the normal time not the normal day but like just mm. a one-off that you and I can do because 
I do quite a lot of social media. In fact, I have I have people that do my social media now, <laughs> <laughs> which makes me sound very important, but I'm not. Um, but I but I can certainly help out on blogging and things like that. I mean, I set up my business with blogging every day. Um, I don't do it every day now because I haven't got the time, but I know how to. Um, you know, and it and it's also just kind of how to get it out there and how to get it seen because it's all very well having things out there but how do you actually make people well, otherwise what's, what's the point of writing it mm. if you're writing a blog what's the point yeah. of having it out there if no one's going to actually find yeah. it so um yeah me, me and is, Steve will have a chat yeah which is one of the reasons <laughs> that I do some of the things I do you know um, yeah. sharing some of the members uh websites on social media and of course the summary uh blogs that I've been doing um long, long delay between the last two but um uh, sorry no between the last kind of double one yeah. and the one before that but <laughs> it it helps to get out there that uh, our members are busy blogging away or some of them are and yeah and gives links to definitely. them um, yeah definitely yeah well uh, Lucy says that sounds like an awesome idea. Steve, are you volunteering? I think it's probably uh, probably a double <laughs> act, maybe. I don't know. Heaven <laughs> forbid, thinking... Steve. You, you and me are double act. Good God. <laughs> oh, dear. It's a short answer. It's, to <laughs> it's a short answer to Richard's question, though. A blog can be anything you want it to be. So, mm. to one extent, it can be a substantial piece of work. Mm. And Steve's got some great ones that have been spread over three weeks with in-depth research that are mini articles in their own right at the yeah. other extreme it can be a photograph mm. but I think it's I, I from what I took Richard I might have taken your question completely out of context I, th I thought Richard was saying how the heck do I put it out there like yeah. what do I put it on um, mm. so I th and I think that's part of you know lots of people have a lot of stories to tell but it's like where do I put them how yeah. do I set it up yeah not necessarily yeah, want right. software to use because you don't need software but but where to put it and how to put it there yeah if you don't have a website <laughs> you've got nowhere to put a blog have you oh yes you mm. do oh yes yeah, oh yes you do this way's <laughs> red Matt. yes but we'll we'll tell you all don't worry <laughs> yeah WordPress all right i'm sure blogger. i'm sure karen would welcome things for destinations as well so mm. It doesn't have to end yeah, up being a blog. Absolutely. It can be a little item or a big yeah. item for that. Yeah. So, it depends so on what. Those. It depends what you want to achieve with it. Like, where, where do you see your followers? That your well, not necessarily followers, but the people that are going to find you and your study. Where are they going to come from? Are they going to find you on Tinternet? Are they going to find you in destinations? It, it's yeah, yes. You, we do want stuff for destinations, and if you've got fantastic stuff about shared endeavour, but I think. If I was writing a blog about my place, I'd want it out there on, online. Mm. And if I didn't know how to do it, then I'd be sat here with lots of stories in my back pocket. So, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah. Liz, that's the answer, but, yeah. but it's how to. You, you absolutely yeah. got that, but it's a lot of people don't know what those things are or how the hell they work. Yeah. <laughs> and then everybody that, changes. Is, is that it, Richard? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Well, I think Steve, I'd walk Steve into a into a project for next year with me. It's a trap. <laughs> yep. So he was joining a committee and look where that got you. <laughs> so, you know, when I said at the AGM, those of you that were there, that we have fun at our committee meetings. Now you see why. <laughs> Anyways, it's getting on with time. So I think we've probably better wrap this up for this evening. Thank you so much, everybody. I hope the questions if you didn't have the answers to them, might kind of stick in your mind and you can take them away. Um, very happy to um, you know, share slides and whatever. There's nothing particularly exciting on there. Um, so if anybody wants to get in touch with me, funnily enough, I am chair at One Pace Studies. Um, so drop me a line, very happy to send those along. If you just want them as prompts, that's absolutely not an issue. I'm very happy to share those. Thank you, so, very, thank you very much. much. Yeah, thank you, Kirsty, for the presentation and making us think and talk. It's okay. <laughs> that's what i try and do <laughs> and we, we'll see you all next month hopefully perfect enjoy christmas and new year and all that jazz <laughs> bye bye, bye. bye.